Good evening, everyone. I am Lion Habiba Cooper Jallo, and I'm pleased to join you all at the New Voices of Canada Embrace Diversity Virtual Symposium. So today I'm going to be speaking to you about a devastating medical condition of which I'm very passionate to end. It's called obstetric fistula, and it came to my attention 12 years ago when I was just 12 years old uh, through an article about a young woman from Niger named Anafgat Ayuba. So I read an article about her which detailed her experience developing this condition. She was married early at about 12 or 13 years old. She gave birth to a stillborn baby boy and it was sometime after giving birth uh, that she began leaking urine um, and feces all the time. Uh, and um, when she was taken to the hospital for treatment, she learned that she had an obstetric fistula. Um, her treatment was successful. She was cured of her fistula. She went back to her community. She spoke on the radio. She resumed her studies, and she was very passionate about girls' empowerment um, after that. And so sometime later, I read another article about her which said that Two years after her treatment, she had died uh, due to complications of an infection. So I was very heartbroken by the second article because, you know, for me, in one article she was alive and in the next she was dead. So it was, it was very shocking and that's what prompted me to do more research on um, obstetric fistula. And it's in doing more research about it that... Uh, it completely changed my life and I, I became an advocate to end it. I was so inspired, I was so compelled to help bring an end to this devastating condition that affects so many women and girls around the world. Uh, at this point, you're likely wondering what is obstetric fistula. So like I mentioned earlier, it's um, a medical condition. It's essentially a childbirth injury, so it's something that um, is the result of a prolonged and a complicated childbirth in which the woman's labor is blocked basically and she does not have access to emergency medical care this would be a c-section and so due to that lack of access her labor goes on for too long it could be three days it could be four days um, the baby forces its way through her birth canal and she's left with this hole between her the vagina and her um, her bladder or in some cases between her vagina and her rectum in some cases both um, and so the result of this condition is that she always leaks these waste products whether it be urine feces or in some cases both and um, due to the smell that she has she's usually abandoned by her community, uh, sometimes by her husband, often by her husband. Um, so she lives as an outcast in, in her community. And sadly, due to lack of access to treatment, less than 1% of women and girls who suffer from obstetric fistula will receive treatment in their lifetime. Uh, so this statistic, it's appalling and it's also unacceptable, which um, makes my work relevant and pressing and I, I think drives home to all of us the need for more action um, the, the need for more action around ending obstetric fistula globally it is estimated that there are about two to three million women living with this condition and every year there are about a hundred thousand new cases that's according to the World Health Organization. Um, yet I already told you that less than 1% will receive treatment in their lifetime. Even though this condition is treatable, it's fully treatable, and once the women receive treatment for it, they can lead a normal life once again, um, and they'll be dry for the rest of their lives once they receive obstetric fistula surgery. However, it's very important to bear in mind that this is a condition that affects very poor women in remote areas and hard to reach areas, not in capital cities. So even in countries where you find obstetric fistula is a problem, in countries of Asia and countries of Africa, it's 
uncommon in capital cities. If you speak to women in some of the capital cities, uh, they've never heard of it, you know. So you find it in the very remote areas of these low resource countries. Um, it costs about $900 Canadian to treat uh, uh, a woman suffering from obstetric fistula so it is a fully treatable condition there are surgeons in these countries who um, have the capacity and who have the surgical skill to treat it however there there's a treatment gap and there's a backlog in cases some of the reasons for this backlog uh, include difficulties in getting to the center um, delays once at the center so women might arrive at the treatment facility and there's no surgeon available to treat them or once the surgeon becomes available uh, that facility might have a limited capacity at that time so there might be hundreds of women waiting for treatment when in reality they can only treat uh, but a few of them. The numbers are too high and uh, some women receive treatment for it in their elderly age, when they're 60, when they're 70, uh, which is way beyond childbearing age, yet they developed the fistula when they were younger, when they were 20, when they were 30, which means that they've lived wet, they've lived leaking waste products for all these decades and it's only um, in their elderly age that they've been able to become dry again so you can just think of uh, the stigma that she's been through uh, all those decades the shame the humiliation um, the the depression all of those psychological effects and there are also co-illnesses associated with con this condition such as nerve damage such as foot drop uh, sometimes infertility uh, sometimes narrowing of the vagina so it's very sad when you think of the burden of the disease um, and how it affects these women for many decades and how it reduces the, the quality of their life uh, in such a considerable way. Recently in Ghana, I met a 33-year-old mother named Ruhia who had this condition um, and it was very hard for her while she was living with it because she had her young newborn child um, of two months and then she also had a 10 year old daughter and uh, because she was leaking all the time her husband abandoned her and went to another region of the country and basically said to her uh, I don't want to see you again until you're dry you know so she was alone having to take care of these two children um, having to wear diapers she said she wore diapers and she said the smell was so bad that if she were in a room with you you would want to leave you would just immediately have to leave the room uh, so this was what she was experiencing on her own uh, and she went to one hospital where they attempted to treat her and they were unsuccessful uh, but not only were they unsuccessful uh, there was also a lack of quality patient care she said they were uh, rude they mistreated her they didn't explain what they were doing to her and it wasn't until she found um, a very lovely uh, obstetric fistula surgeon at Korlebu Hospital uh, one of Ghana's uh, main hospitals uh, um, in the capital Accra it wasn't until she went there that she found um, a very lovely surgeon who treated her on Christmas Day and who explained to her what was actually happening uh, what had happened to her body, what she was living with. Um, so that was her story. Some years ago in Ethiopia, um, I also met uh, a young girl who was just 15 years old at the time. And it was very interesting because I happened to be 15 years old at the time then too. And uh, I met her at the hospital, the Fistula Hospital in Ethiopia, and she was awaiting treatment. Um, so at that point, she wasn't dry and she explained to me what her experience had been basically she came from a very rural region very remote because uh, i got to witness her region myself when I, I took a trip out to her region so very remote very poor region and um, she was married early she developed this fistula uh, and there happened to be recruiters from the hospital, from the Addis Ababa Fistula Hospital in the city, uh, in her region, uh, basically like outreach, members of an outreach team going to look for potential cases and bring the woman to a treatment site. So there happened to be a recruiter in her uh, town who found her 
and took her to a city not too far from her town, a city called Makale in northern Ethiopia. And the doctors there said they couldn't treat her because her fistula was too severe. She had a double fistula, meaning what I explained earlier, between uh, both the bladder and the rectum. So hers was double. They said it was too severe that she had to go to the city where uh, the doctors there would be better equipped to treat her. So the first time didn't work. She went to the city, which is where I met her in Addis Ababa. And even then she was still awaiting surgery. So you could see, you could sense the uncertainty in her because um, it's never guaranteed that the surgery will be successful. The success rate is high. There's about a 97% chance success rate. Um, but there's also, there's always that uh, small chance that it might not be successful and um, so in her I could really just sense that that uncertainty uh, at the same time that anticipation and that desire to be dry again to lead a normal life to go back to school these are things she told me um, and to return home to her region which she very much wanted to do uh, and she was telling me that in her region they have such large mount mountains, so she was very proud of that. She was telling me about the Ethiopian millennium, which was uh, a while ago, and that that was her happiest moment during the millennium. So this is just a snapshot into the lives of some of the fistula patients. There are millions of other stories that could be told, uh, and each one of them is moving uh, in, in its own way. And, you know, I already explain to you that the treatment capacity is lagging behind that you have all these women living with it in some countries uh, the burden is so high in a country like Nigeria where it's estimated to be half a million and some estimates will be even higher at one million just one country alone having all these cases of obstetric fistula in a country like Ghana where the Ghanaian UNFPA, the Ghanaian United Nations Population Fund office, estimates that there are about 1,300 new cases per year, yet only 100 repairs per year, and only seven trained obstetric fistula surgeons. The need is pressing, and we must also think about the developmental impact on these women and especially the young woman when you develop this at such a young age when you're 17 or when you're 13 or when you're 18 and you live with it for decades which means you're out of school so your opportunity to go to school is lost your opportunity to work and many of them used to work they used to um, herd goats they used to sell in the market your opportunity to work is also also becomes non-existent that's taken away from you so we have to think about the effect it has on them developmentally, on their learning, on their potential to self-actualize, to accomplish their dreams, to be meaningful, contributing members of society. All of that becomes non-existent. So it's a crime in so many ways. It's a crime on so many levels. Uh, it strips these women and girls of their dignity. It denies them the possibility to become the best and the most impactful version of themselves uh, to, to contribute to transformational change in their countries. You know, I already mentioned that these are low resource countries. These are places like Nigeria, like Ethiopia, like Mauritania. It denies them the opportunity to to create change, to, to contribute to infrastructural development, to teach youth, to teach children, to become teachers, to become doctors, to become engineers, and really uh, set their countries forward to help end obstetric fistula in their own countries. So we have a duty to these girls, to these fistula patients, um, and it's part of our larger duty to humanity to make sure that no one suffers from a preventable condition that's a very old condition because we know fistula is an ancient condition it's thousands of years old um, there were writings about it from ancient Egypt you know 
uh, there were writings on the on the tombs of, uh, of of ancient Egyptian pharaohs about obstetric fistula. So we know it's a very ancient condition, um, and we know it's treatable. It's eradicable. Uh, we know how to treat it. It can be treated. So we need to ask ourselves: Why are these women left to suffer? In a sense, to waste away, as harsh as that that might sound, to develop depression, to become suicidal, to to be forgotten about by their communities, by their societies, to be treated as pariahs by their own husbands, by their own family members, to be denied the possibility to get on public transportation if they live in a remote area and they're trying to get to a city for treatment because of their smell, because of their constant dripping. They're denied the possibility to get on transportation in some cases and they have to walk long distances, 17 hours, 20 hours, over mountains and over rivers to reach their destination. So we all need to think about that because this is a disease not only of poverty, which I mentioned earlier, but also a disease of inequality. And it speaks to the larger issue of of gender inequality in the world, of socionomic, of class inequality. And the resources are there to treat them the skill is there i said the resources are there the money can be provided to fund their surgeries we just need to distribute wealth in a more equitable way to make sure that it gets to these women so that they too can become productive members of our society and and contributors to our global economies in 2012 i started my nonprofit organization. It's called the Women's Health Organization International, WOI, or W-H-O-I. I began it with the objective to bring awareness to obstetric fistula through advocacy, events, and fundraising. We've been quite active throughout Halifax, Canada, and the UK through our events and programming, and also through the publication of my children's book, Yeshi Alam Learns About Fistula, which is an awareness-building tool. My work on fistula has taken me to hospitals, and clinics across Africa where I've had the immense privilege to interact with surgeons and patients as a way to learn more about the condition and to witness firsthand how it affects the women and girls physically and socially. Our most recent trip was to fistula centers in Ghana in 2018 and uh, a couple of months ago in March of 2020 I had the pleasure of presenting to the Lions Club of Wolfville, Nova Scotia, under the stewardship of Kim Stewart, about our current fundraising efforts in Ghana and how people can become involved through fundraising, advocacy, and political engagement. So now in closing, I'd like to bring you back to the story of Anafgat, the young woman from Niger. Had it not been for obstetric fistula and a lack of access to quality birthing and reproductive care, Today, she would have been an adult woman pursuing her dreams and making great contributions to society. I'd therefore like to call upon all of you to join hands with me in bringing an end to obstetric fistula once and for all. It's been a pleasure speaking with you here this evening at this virtual symposium. I'd like to salute all the lions globally. Thank you for listening to my message and have a great evening.